Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me well. Okay, let's get started. Um, so Professor Mutli is out of town. So for today's lecture, um, we'll be um, uh, covering the topics that he started and then uh, continue with introduction to the labs, which will start on this Friday and then we'll continue for the following 10 weeks. Uh, my name is Hassan, I'm a PhD student and uh, one of the TAs uh, in this class. Um, yeah, so as I said, we'll start with the fourth mysteries that Professor Mutlu started last lecture and we'll finish the last two. Um, yeah, and then I will tell you about uh, what we'll do uh, in the labs in the following weeks. Okay, any, any questions before we start? Cool. Um, okay, yeah, so we'll continue with uh, memory refresh. Um, so this was the third mystery. So just uh, uh, as a quick recap, uh, in the last lecture, we learned that DRAM capacitors are leaky and they, they lose charge over time, and this leads to eventually losing the data. Um, so in order to keep data in memory, the memory controller periodically uh, refreshes the DRAM cells. And um, typically this happens at 64 uh, milliseconds uh, interval uh, in DRAM we have today. So the downsides of refresh are that it consumes additional energy, uh, which is obvious because you are like performing additional operations. Um, so those are activate and precharge operations or operations similar to those basically. And um, because uh, while DRAM is being refreshed, you are keeping some uh, resources busy, um, it's not possible to do the access simultaneously, uh, well, mostly at least, uh, while um, the DRAM is getting refreshed. So that this leads to performance degradation and um, also refresh causes, uh, leads to some QoS and predictability issues uh, because of, uh, like, again, the same issue, the DRAM is getting paused while it's getting refreshed. And uh, finally, uh, the refresh also limits uh, DRAM uh, capacity scaling because as you increase the capacity you get like more cells that you need to refresh and this is basically causing like longer pauses um, in those 64 millisecond periods. Okay, so um, apparently refresh is an important problem um, as DRAM rows uh, have to be refreshed very frequently at 64 milliseconds and um, so how can we solve this problem? Um, or what can we do about it to, to get, uh, or to eliminate some of its um, downsides? Um, so one question is, what if we knew what happened underneath uh, and that information was exposed to upper layers? So specifically, so um, if, if you can understand exactly why we need to refresh the DRM cells and exactly for how long they can retain the data, uh, can we do something with it at the upper levels in the transformation stack? Um, so when we look at the DRAM today, um, so with the 64 millisecond refresh, so periodically refreshing every single cell at 64 millisecond, DRAM looks something like this, right? So it's uniform, all the cells, we treat them like they can retain data for the same amount of time. But in reality, uh, DRAM retention time profile looks something like this, right? So very, uh, let me see if I can get my mouse here. Okay, I think I'm mentioning so. Um, yeah, so as you can see here, only um, very small number of uh, cells actually can retain data between 64 to 128 milliseconds. So those are the cells that really need to be refreshed at 64 milliseconds in order to retain their data. But majority of the cells can retain data for much longer uh, like even seconds. Um, okay, so what can we do with such profiles? So if you know actually, like if you know for every single cell, how much, uh, for how long it can retain its data, can we do something about that? Um, but before like going into that question, let's uh, discuss why we end up with such a profile in today's DRAM. So um, the answer is that, um, the manufacturing is not perfect. So a single DRAM cell, as you learned in the last lecture, consists of a single access transistor and a uh, single capacitor, right? But those 
components cannot be perfectly manufactured. Uh, sometimes the uh, capacitors and uh, excess transistors are smaller, sometimes they are bigger, uh, and that basically leaks uh, for this difference that like some uh, cells leak charge faster than the others. And um, this is basically called manufacturing process variation. And um, yeah, we'll talk about this later, uh, a, little bit, a little bit more later. Uh, so here, apparently we have the opportunity to, to take advantage um, of this profile. Um, and assuming that we know the retention time of each DRAM row exactly, um, uh, what can we do with this information? And um, in which, so in this transformation stack here, uh, to which level uh, do we need to expose this information and how much do we need to, uh, to expose? Uh, so those are all questions that we need to answer while like uh, developing a mechanism that will take advantage of this profile and reduce the, uh, the cost of refresh or get rid of refresh completely if possible. Okay, uh, and in this class, we will specifically look at those three levels as, um, as we discussed before. So here's some um, real data from an actual, from a real DRA module of 32 gigabytes. And um, here the observation is that like majority of the DRAM rows can be refreshed much uh, less frequently without losing their data. And in this figure on the x-axis, you see the um, the refresh interval, and on the y-axis you see the cumulative cell failure probability, and also on the um, right-hand side the number of cells in 32 um, gigabyte DRAM that fail at that given refresh interval. So for example, um, yeah, if you look at um, on the x-axis at the point where we have 128 milliseconds, we see that only about 30 cells fail. Um, and at uh, 256 milliseconds, only about 1,000 cells fail. Um, so this is like a very small amount of cells when we consider the entire module, which is which has like a billions of cells, right? Uh, 32 gigabytes of uh, memory. So uh, so there's definitely like a lot of um, unnecessary refresh going on inside the DRAM when we treat every cell equally and refresh them at 64 milliseconds. Um, and the question is, can we exploit this to reduce the fresh operation? And can we do that at low cost without like introducing too much area or power overhead? Um, okay, and um, so we already said that. So one idea here to exploit this is like this, the simplest idea maybe is to um, refresh weak rows more frequently. So here we define weak row as a row that contains cell that will fail, like let's say after 64 milliseconds, right? And uh, we have strong rows that can retain data for much longer. Um, yeah, so the simple mechanism of this uh, paper that was published in 2012, uh, Raider, is that we refresh weak rows more frequently and all other rows less frequently. And this mechanism proposes a, um, a, um, a technique basically that can be implemented at very low cost. So we will discuss it more. Um, and this is the paper. If you want to uh, read it, you can, um, um, yeah, you, you, you can like read it to get more details. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's start with um, with some details about this mechanism. So I will give a like very uh, high level idea of the mechanism. As I said, you can go and read the paper if you're interested to learn more. So the first thing to enable this mechanism is to actually do the profiling, right? So like when you get a DRAM module, first we have to, to figure out like for how long each row in this DRAM can retain the data. So this can be either done at design time or during operation. So like you can go to the store and purchase a DRAM along with that information, like saying that for how long each row can retain data. But you can do it yourself as well, like when you plug in on your machine. And there are like different ways proposed to do this profiling. Um, so you, you can find some references to those in the papers that you will read about the armor fresh. Uh, so we will not going to co cover these in this lecture. Um, so second, after having this uh, retention time profile, um, what this mechanism doing is uh, it implements something called bloom filters 
to efficiently um, to efficiently store this information of for how long each row can retain its data. So if you like do it in the naive way, so storing like a uh, some uh, some value indicating for how long the row can store its data for every single row, you will end up with like thousands of different values, and then this will require a lot of storage. Um, so this paper proposes a, um, an intelligent way of doing it with less overhead using Bloom filters. Um, so we won't go into details of those, but uh, there are some backup slides and the, at the end of this presentation, so you can go and see those. Um, and these are actual data structures that are used at different um, um, at, 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 at different uh, contexts. So you can you can even just like search for Bloom filters and read uh, more about it. Um, but basically, what Bloom filter is doing is uh, so you. you, you it basically responds to queries of um, set membership. So you, you, uh, assuming that you store this information in the Bloom filter, you store the information of like uh, how, for, for how long each row can retain uh, its data, uh, you can query this Bloom filter with the given row, and it will respond you with like um, whether that row can retain data for let's say 64 milliseconds or whether it can retain for more. Okay, yeah, so after doing the profiling, we, we basically obtained this um, profile that is shown here in this picture, and um, this mechanism lost this into uh, the Bloom filter structures, and later, um, so this Bloom filter storage, as I said, is um, like quite small, with only 125 kilobytes of storage, you can store the information of uh, 32 gigabytes of DRM memory. And, uh, and the third step of this mechanism is uh, when during the refresh operation, the memory controller queries this Bloom filter to determine whether the row that, is about, uh, that the memory controller is about to refresh really has to be refreshed or it can retain data until the next um, refresh uh, period or the next refresh interval. Okay, any questions so far? Is this clear? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The question is whether this profile is static or it changes over time. Um, the answer is it's mostly static, but there's a something called a VRT, um, which stands for um, variable retention time. So some cells tend to change. Um, retention time states, so sometimes they can retain data for uh, X amount of time, and after a while they retain data for a shorter or, or longer. But those are usually um, like not the majority of the cells that show this behavior, but yeah. So this is mostly static, so you can maybe um, over provision, so you can like test, like in instead of like figuring out exactly like to mill a millisecond level for how long this uh, cells can retain data, you can over provision and then say, okay, if this can retain data for one uh, second, I will treat it that like it can retain data for half second, right? And this will basically provide you some guard band with the um, operations you do after that. Yeah, but you may need to like dynamically reprofile once in a while if you wanna like capture uh, this uh, dynamic behavior. Okay, any other question? Yes. Yeah, it's possible, as I said, but not for all the cells at the same time. Yeah, so very small amount of cells may change uh, their retention times. Yes. Um, not directly, as far as I know, like not exactly this mechanism, but um, there might be like some tricks that some manufacturers are doing to, to do this at coarser granularity maybe, but yeah, I'm not aware of like any real implementation of this particular mechanism. Okay. Um, 
Okay, and also let's talk about the, some results um, of this mechanism. Uh, so, um, so the authors of this paper tested this mechanism with 32 gigabyte DRAM on eight core machine with various workloads. And um, the hardware cost for the bloom filter structure is 125 kilobytes. And um, using this mechanism, they, uh, it turns out that th they can get rid of uh, almost 75% of the refresh operations. So this is a huge reduction. And because of this, uh, since the DRAM is performing less DRAM uh, refresh, um, they noticed that the DRAM energy consumption reduces by 16%. So this is uh, dynamic DRAM energy, which is like the energy consumption of the DRAM while it is um, being accessed at the same time. Uh, and the idle DRAM power consumption reduces even more by 20%. So this is when just the DRAM is idle and you don't like um, issue any requests to it. Okay, so the DRAM is not accessed. And this also leads to performance improvement, mainly because like there's like more time to do the accesses and less time spent on the refresh operations. Um, and one additional benefit of this mechanism is that its benefits increase as the DRAM density scales. So here in this figure, um, hopefully it's not too small, uh, you can see here on the left-hand side that uh, the energy per access reduces by about 16% with eight gigabyte DRAM, eight gigabit DRAM, sorry, four gigabit DRAM chips. But uh, as the, um, the device technology scales and we can like fit more DRAM cells into a single chip, so here considering a 64 gigabit um, DRAM chip, we see that the, um, the energy per access will reduce up to 50%. Uh, um, so basically this mechanism will have like even more benefits going forward to, uh, to denser DRAM chips. And same for the, for the speed up, you can see on the right hand side figure that uh, we, we, get, we get more, um, more speed up as the density increases. Okay. And for those that are really interested, they can go and uh, read this paper. And there are like even more references. Uh, for those that are even more interested, you can go and read those papers as well. Um, those are not required readings, but yeah, we encourage you to take a look at those as well. So the takeaway here is that uh, breaking the abstraction layers in the transformation hierarchy and knowing what's underneath can uh, lead to like better understanding and uh, can help you solve the problems uh, that are um, quite important here, right? As we see for the refresh case for the uh, for the energy consumption and performance. Okay, so this was about this third mystery. Uh, any questions before we go to the last one? Okay, I don't see any hands. Okay, cool. So the last and fourth mystery is uh, something we call memory performance attacks. And this was a paper published in 2007 um, or nine, I think. Um, Okay, um, so this is related to this picture that uh, Professor Mutler has shown you before. Um, this is essentially a multi-core chip uh, where each core can execute a different workload. Um, so you can get more parallelism. And here we have um, so four cores in this picture and a bunch of caches, more caches, DRAM controller, DRAM interface, and uh, finally uh, some DRAM which we use as a main memory. Okay, um, so Professor Mutter has shown these uh, different processors as well in the last lectures, uh, hopefully you remember. So in the past, people used to design single core processors, but um, as the technology scales down, it became like much more difficult to design such processors um, because um, it, it turned out that like, for example, um, increasing the pipeline depth or implementing uh, mechanisms such as out of order execution are not very scalable and just basically making like bigger and bigger single chip uh, sort of single core processors um, leads to uh, inefficiencies mainly in power consumption um, and area as well. So, um, so designers started designing uh, multi-core chips where you put multiple cores and um, the downside of this is to take advantage of the many chips in the program, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the processor, 
uh, the programmers need to change their programs in order to, um, to make use of those cores, right? Uh, so how many of you have taken the parallel uh, programming or computing class or anything like that? Some people did. Okay, cool. Yeah, so basically, you know that, you know that it's not a trivial task, hopefully, or like for those that haven't programmed um, multi-core processor or haven't written programs that execute on multiple cores, uh, you will, uh, they will learn that later that it's not trivial and then um, basically you have to deal with additional problems because of um, this core level parallelism that you wanna exploit. Okay. Um, so ideally, if you have more cores on the chip, um, you would like to, uh, you would like the throughput of the system to scale with the number of cores you have, right? So for example, if you have n cores, you would like to get n times the performance of a single core. So this is called linear scaling, but um, it's not always possible in practice, and uh, we will, hopefully see why um, in the following slides. So what we get today um, for some workloads is something like this. So here we have um, in, this, um, in, in, in this plot, we have two workloads, MATLAB and GCC. Uh, so GCC is the compiler uh, that hopefully you used. And um, MATLAB, I think um, some of you may know is um, it's, it's, it's another workload that is like um, used a lot. And so what we did here in this experiment or what the authors did in this experiment was to put those two workloads at the same uh, machine and then run them at the same time on different cores. And what happened is, um, as you see here, uh, those two applications uh, got different slowdowns compared to when they were running alone on this the same processor. And here MATLAB got about like 7% slowdown, while GCC got like more than three times slowdown. So, um, so this is uh, obviously some um, unfairness in the system, right? So ideally we would expect uh, for uh, like both applications to get slowed down by like roughly the same amount. But, um, because of some issues here in the system, let's say, uh, they didn't get uh, the same slowdown and they get like uh, total different impacts. Um, so the authors like check whether this is because of like some priority issues in the operating system and they prioritize GCC, uh, they, they give high priority to GCC over MATLAB, but that didn't change um, any, uh, that didn't change the results too much when you do that from the operating system perspective. So uh, apparently something else here was the, um, was the issue that leads to this disparity in slowdowns. Um, any ideas what may cause this problem? So again, just as a reminder, this is a, like a two core uh, system that we are working on. And yeah, and it's, it's running those two applications at the same time. Any ideas? Yes? Maybe so. How, how is the process it has to be written? For example, MATLAB was never so smooth, was never so built that it could be planned well before. For GCC, for example, as a comp compiler, mm -hmm. has, has it easier to utilize more cores? And so if you cannot execute more cores, you cannot execute all the cores, and you have to experience a, a couple of months of one year slowdown when having shared cores than like for example MATLAB. Yeah, so that. Could be a reason, but here in this experiment uh, in particular, those are two single core workloads that we, uh, that the authors run on two cores. So those are not multi-threaded multi applications. Yes? Do both have the same memory? And if the uh, in process of building memory, but I don't mean load to load of core memory and drive to the memory, that's more traffic of the memory that you have to load from. Yes. So, Apparently something like that was happening. So basically two applications are interfering at the main memory level because they have uh, different uh, memory uh, access characteristics as we will see later. Okay, so here um, the authors named this kind of applications that sort of like uh, cause unfair slowdowns, memory performance hogs. 
uh, and we will talk about it more. So uh, let's first look at uh, these three questions. Uh, so can you figure out why the application slowdown if you do not know the underlying system and how it works? Uh, can you figure out why there is a disparity in slowdowns if you do not know how this uh, system executes the problems? And can you fix the problem without knowing what's happening underneath? So basically, those uh, three questions, um, the, the, the answer for those three questions is no, uh, because uh, we have to know something about the underlying system in order to reason about those slowdowns. Um, so let's think a bit more about these questions. So wh uh, why there's a slowdown to begin with? So I think um, uh, it's, it's, it's obvious now that, uh, so, so we already sort of discussed that this is because of interference at the um, main memory level. But um, what really uh, causes this disparity and why they interfere the memory in this way? Uh, so let's try to answer those questions. Um, okay, so first, uh, why this is important? So why this is an important problem? Um, so we, we definitely want to, if, if you have a multi-core processor, we definitely want to make uh, use of it, right? We want to take advantage of those multiple cores. Uh, so uh, especially in cloud and m m mobile platforms. So there are multiple ways of doing that. First, um, you, you, uh, we can like uh, design multi-threaded multi applications uh, where a single application will utilize multiple cores. But it's also possible to put different applications as was in the example here, right? And then we'll run them simultaneously. So this is like especially, um, the case for cloud computing, where is users submit jobs and then other users submit jobs and those uh, jobs from different users run and end up running on the same machine. Um, yeah, so it, it's very t typical that we want to mix different types of applications together and make them run on the same uh, processor. But um, so some applications require um, some QoS uh, guarantees, right? So for example, um, uh, an, an example application here might be pedestrian detection, which might be a very critical, uh, depending on which system you run this, uh, this application uh, in. So for example, in self-driving cars, this can be a really important task, and you may want to ensure that um, this application runs with some QoS uh, guarantees. Uh, and on the same system, you may also want them make some other less important applications. Um, so as a result, we want a system, to, uh, a system that is controllable and also high performance. Um, let me tell you a bit more about the system that executes this MATLAB and GCC workloads. Um, so you don't have to understand everything here um, in this picture, but this is just a high level, um, a picture showing high level building blocks of the system. So we have two cores and two caches that are private for each core here. Uh, so apparently this was the way that people uh, start, first started designing multi-core uh, processors. Now they often have uh, shared caches. And um, as you see in this picture, uh, the only uh, component that they sort of share in the system is the uh, main memory system. Okay, and um, and to understand a little bit more um, exactly why Mat uh, GCC is getting slowed more than MATLAB when you run them together, um, we, 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 we can, um, I, I will show you the following animation. Uh, so the MATLAB turns out to be a very aggressive uh, application, meaning that it generates too many requests, uh, at least a lot more than GCC uh, generates. And, um, and the authors notice that the memory controller unfairly schedules those requests uh, from the MATLAB and always deprioritizes the request, or not always, but for a very long time, deprioritizes the request of, uh, from GCC. Um, and this leads to, um, to more slow, slow down in GCC eventually. Okay, so, um, so the authors find that uh, it is the memory controller who is responsible for this unfairness. And here, uh, let's look deeper into how DRAM operates to understand more exactly why the memory controller is designed in this way and it causes unfairness. Um, so here, uh, we are showing a single bank, a single DRAM bank as an example. 
And um, it, it basically consists of two-dimensional array of DRM cells organized as columns and rows. Um, so this is just an abstraction. Uh, so in the following lectures, I think it will be more uh, covered more about DRAM, and then uh, you will uh, you will learn more. Um, and so internally, as I said, DRAM bank consists of many cells uh, that are built from transistors and capacitors, and other structures that enable access to it. But um, along with this 2D array of DRAM cells inside the DRAM bank, there is also a structure called row buffer. So this is essentially a cache for the row that, uh, that you would like to access. So in order to access the data from a row, first operation is to load the data of that row to the row buffer. So again, this is just an abstraction. Um, like if you look at the, uh, what's going on underneath, uh, so these are, the, the, the row buffer is made of a like, bunch of sense amplifiers and um, sense amplifiers basically um, are used to detect the data that is stored in those small DRAM cells. So remember that the, uh, the capacitors are very small in DRAM because you wanna put like more and more cells into the DRAM chip. And for this reason, uh, the sense amplifiers are essential to amplify that data that's stored in the DRAM cells to make it uh, readable um, uh, by the processor. Okay, so um, I will show an example here of like bunch of accesses to dem demonstrate what's happening when we run uh, GCC and MATLAB at the same time. So let's assume that initial the row buffer is empty and we get a access request to row zero, column zero. So the first operation here will be uh, to, to load row zero to the row, uh, to the row buffer. Um, so the memory controller supplies this uh, access request, right? So along with the row and the column it wants to access. Um, and then the row decoder uh, is responsible for activating the row that is uh, gonna be accessed. So in this example, it is row zero. And, um, and this blue box is how we represent uh, an activated row. So upon activation, the data of that row zero is loaded into the row buffer. At this point, the memory controller can, uh, can provide the column address and um, in this row, which is like quite wide, typically it's uh, about four, uh, eight kilobytes, um, the column address determines which part of this eight kilobyte to read uh, to, the, uh, to the processor. So let's say you wanna read only one byte from this eight kilobyte uh, row buffer. And um, this structure over here, the column MUX here, which, is, which stands for a multiplexer, uh, basically, uh, forwards data or, or forwards portion of that row buffer that we are interested in reading. Um, and for this first, we complete this first access by, um, by forwarding this data from column zero to the processor. And then let's assume that the second access we get is again to row zero, but this time to column one. Um, since um, at this point we have the row buffer already loaded with the data of row zero, the memory controller skips the activation, the row activation part, so it can directly provide the column address and read a different part of the row buffer. Um, so as you have noticed, this operation is uh, much shorter this time because we don't have to activate the row, right? So we, uh, the, the memory controller directly issues a column uh, address to read the portion of already loaded row buffer. And and basically for every request at this point, we get to row zero, the memory controller can just issue the column address to, to read different parts of the, um, of the already opened or activated row. But um, if a request targets a different row, uh, the first thing that the memory controller has to do is to, to close this row zero and to load, a, uh, to, to load row one. Uh, so this we call row buffer conflict. So when you have a different row loaded in the row buffer, but you wanna access a, um, a, an, an, another row from that bank, uh, we define this case as row buffer conflict. And um, before actually activating row one, uh, the memory controller first closes row zero or pre-charges row zero. 
So this again has additional, uh, it, it takes additional time to, to do this operation, to close this row, and then eventually um, activate row zero, uh, row one, and then load its data to the row buffer. And then after this point, the, um, the memory controller continues with issuing the column address and then reads the data. So this is like pretty much how uh, DRAM bank operates um, at a high level. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so, um, so people designing these systems um, say that we can take advantage of this fact, uh, which is like, if you, have, if you have your row open in the row buffer and the following requests hit in that row buffer, they can be serviced with much lower latency. So the designers wanted to take advantage of this. And, um, and basically the current controllers are designed to, to exploit this. Uh, so one policy uh, that takes advantage of this fact is uh, FRFCFS, which stands for first ready, first come, first serve. So what this request scheduling policy does is it, um, in the request buffer where you um, store like a bunch of incoming uh, memory requests, it search for requests first that will um, hit in the row buffer. So if you have a row that is like already opened. And yeah, so those requests that hit in the row buffer are prioritized. And the second set of rows that get priority is those that, uh, that are the oldest, right? So there's uh, rows, uh, requests are getting um, issued to the, um, to the row buffer at different times. So those that have arrived um, um, first will be scheduled first according to this policy. And those two, um, two um, prioritiz prioritization policies leads to the unfairness that we see between the MATLAB and GCC workloads. And I will tell you exactly why that happens. Um, yeah, so the goal of designing this policy was to, to maximize the DRAM throughput. So if you think about it, it will make sense if you are running a, um, if you are implementing this policy on a single core processor or running a single workload, because um, this policy will try to schedule a request um, as soon as possible and get it serviced with the lowest possible latency. So basically this policy will get rid of unnecessary row buffer conflicts or, of, or creating row buffer conflicts. Okay, so the problem is that uh, today multiple applications share the DRAM controller on, the, on those multi-core multi -core processors, and the DRAM controllers are designed to maximize data throughput, but they don't have, um, uh, they're they not designed to provide fairness, basically. Um, so let's talk about why the row hit first and all those first policies are unfair. So first, a row hit first policy is unfair uh, or unfairly prioritizes applications that have very high row buffer locality. So um, we will show an example for this in the uh, next slide, but basically what happens is if there's a request from that application that always or mostly hits in the row buffer, uh, the request of this application will be always prioritized over applications that tend to have more random access. And second, the oldest first policy unfairly prioritizes memory intensive applications. So these are applications that um, generate too many memory requests. And the reason for this is that, uh, so let's assume that an application just like um, very occasionally generates a, a memory request and it gets stuck behind many requests that came earlier from this memory intensive application. So basically uh, such a uh, request of such an application that rarely generates a request will get stuck for a very long time and will get a very high latency. Okay, um, so as a result, DRAM controllers today are vulnerable to denial of service attacks. So um, 
so, so someone can design a malicious or can, can write a malicious program that will exploit this unfairness and cause like uh, slowdowns on other applications running on the same system. Um, okay, so here's such a program, uh, which is a simple streaming application. Um, so it's written in C-like um, program, as you see here. Uh, basically what it does is it copies one array, uh, so here array B, it copies array B here to array A while uh, making sure that um, the request are from the cache. And to do that, as you see here, uh, this index, uh, sorry, the index J is uh, multiplied by the line for every access, we skip a cache line. Okay, so all generated here, we get different cache lines. And since this is a streaming application, streaming meaning that uh, sequential locations in the DRM are uh, getting accessed, uh, this results in a very high row buffer locality, 96% uh, hit rate in this case. So it's not 100% because like eventually uh, the entire row that is open will be, uh, um, will be covered and then the application will switch to an, a different row. And uh, this is the reason why we don't get 100% hit rate because we are like streaming through different roles in DRM. Okay. On the other hand, uh, here we have uh, a different application that does exactly the same thing. So again, it copies the data of B, uh, array B to array A. But instead of sequential accessing locations, it um, accesses those two arrays in random manner. Um, as you see here, uh, the index is generated uh, randomly. And uh, since this application uh, is like roughly equally memory intensive, um, it gets very low row buffer locality because the accesses are random and every time this, uh, this application will generate a request that targets a different row in DRAM. Okay. Um, okay, we have three more minutes. So let me quickly go over this example. So here we will show a toy example illustrating what happens when we run GCC and MATLAB on the same system. Um, so this is the same picture we saw on the previous slide. And um, let's assume that initially in the memory request buffer, we have a request from application T0, which is a streaming application. Um, and uh, this request accesses row zero in the DRAM. Um, and initially for convenience, we assume that uh, the row buffer already have row zero opened in DRAM. Okay, so the memory controller will uh, first uh, schedule this request because uh, there is no any other request in the request buffer at this time. And, um, and at some other uh, point, we, uh, we get two other requests in the memory request buffer. Um, which are uh, targeting row zero and row 16. So here, since the row buffer is already open, based on the FRFCFS policy, the memory controller will uh, prioritize a um, request from T0 again that targets row zero. And um, this will continue in a similar way and the memory controller will always prioritize a request that targets the already open row, resulting in delaying those requests of the other applications for a very long time. Okay, so we get a lot of requests from that. Um, and um, so here, for how long those requests will be delayed will really depends on, on the system. It depends on how big are the rows and, um, and of course what those applications are doing, uh, but you need to, you, you, you can do the math and find like uh, how many of those streaming requests the the memory controller services first before before servicing a single request of this uh, random uh, of the other application that accesses the memory randomly. Okay, um, is this part clear? Any questions? Okay, so hopefully now it's clear why uh, there's such a uh, like disparity in slowdowns between the GCC and MATLAB. So essentially what happens in those workloads is the same thing, right? So MATLAB here is like the 
the streaming application, whereas the GCC is the random access application. Okay, we will continue after the break. Okay, I think we should continue now. Is everybody ready? Okay, great. Uh, so we don't have much time. We still have to cover introduction to the lab, so I will try to, uh, to do the second part uh, quicker. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Um, okay, so we discussed this memory performance hog problem, and um, hopefully you are convinced that uh, this is important and can cause denial of service at the memory uh, system level. Um, so how, uh, how can we solve this problem? Um, and what is the right place to solve this problem in this uh, tr transformation stack? Um, so is it the programmer who should solve this? Uh, or system software or compiler. Um, so at the programmer level, probably it's not a very uh, good solution um, since the programmer may not have access to, uh, to some lower level uh, details going on underneath. Um, so similarly, the compiler just compiles a single application, right? So it's not typically aware of other applications that will run together with the application that it's compiling. Uh, so the, at, at the hardware level, uh, the memory controller or, or DRAM can be potential, uh, potentially the right place to, to implement something to solve this problem. Um, okay, so the two goals of this course, as, um, as Professor Mutlu, I think, mentioned a few times, is that uh, it's to enable you to think critically to find solutions to uh, the problems existing in uh, computer architecture and enable you to think broadly. Okay, so for those who are interested, so this is the paper that discusses this um, memory performance attacks problem. Uh, you can go and read that. And there are like even more references over here. Um, so the, uh, the takeaway again is that like knowing what is going on underneath as we saw in this example as well can help you understand and solve the problems. And uh, the cooperation between multiple components and layers can enable more effective solutions and systems. Uh, so those were the four mysteries that we uh, covered so far. Any questions? I guess somebody's happy that this ended. Um, okay. Okay, then we have more takeaways here. Um, it is an exciting time to understand and design, uh, design computer archi uh, architectures, especially with the uh, um, with like new uh, applications and new uh, sort of like platforms and technologies emerging. Um, so there are like many uh, challenging and exciting problems that no one has uh, tackled before and can have huge impact. Uh, so especially uh, those things driven by like uh, big data, uh, new applications such as uh, machine learning, uh, graph analytics, genomics, and et cetera. Um, um, Okay, and so th th these are the five basically main walls that um, we, we, we see problems around, right? So the energy, reliability, complexity, security, and scalability. Uh, so here we have a required uh, lecture video from Professor Mutlu that will help you understand more why uh, to study computer architecture, why it's important, and not know more about future computing architectures. So um, yeah, this is a required assignment and you can optionally, uh, so watching the video and understanding it is, is the required assignment, but optionally you can also submit a uh, one page summary of this uh, lecture to get 1% extra credit. Um, and these are the things that you should include in your one page summary basically. What are your key, uh, key tico, uh, takeaways? What did you learn? What did you like or dislike? And uh, you should submit your summary to this uh, mailing list over here. Okay, any questions about this so far? If not, we'll continue with the second part uh, where we will discuss uh, the introduction to the labs. Okay, let me quickly switch to the...